where they can download the um, the CME. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So it's basically you click on the link, you answer like the standard CME questions of like, did this, do they meet the learning objectives, things like that. And then at the bottom, once you press submit, it'll take it to a certificate and. She's supposed to be on each certificate the name of that particular CME. So today would be air quality, climate change, or transportation, one CME credit. And so that way it'll have four different names on the four different CMEs if people do all four. Okay, great. And we already have um, our Florida clinicians group. Their plan is to basically watch this together at their Wednesday meeting. So that's oh, quite terrific. A good yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, so you know we'll we'll get this up on our website pretty quickly so that so that they can do that together um, because they were like, you know, it would really it would like be a great thing to do for general members and an easy and kind of like take some of the workload off of Melissa and Cheryl for programming. So they're we're really grateful for the ability to do this at their general meeting. Um, okay. So yeah, just say next or slide or whatever. Okay. It's natural for you, and I will skip through them. Sounds good. Thanks, Bev. <clears throat> and I'll probably I'll kind of like go into the background and anon anonymously stop my video and stop my audio, so I'm just so everyone else's faces are brought to the top. <laughs> And okay, so I think we're gonna go live in one minute. Are you signing people in individually? I know, um, no. Everyone okay. gets rushed in one because people can't speak or anything, you know. The only thing people can do is participate in the chat. You won't see anyone's faces. You will see their name on a participant list, but it's thankfully lower stress in terms of people's audio being on or things happening in the background because they're, they're, they don't have that ability. So I think it'll, it'll take a minute for everyone to kind of be rushed in. So I'm going to broadcast and then you'll see the participant list go up.
I uh, want to welcome uh, our uh, participants in today's webinar um, and we'll be starting in just a, a, a minute, one minute. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the July Continuing Medical Education webinar series offered by the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. I'm Dr. Mona Sarfati, family physician and public health physician, and convening uh, this series. Um, these will be held on Fridays from noon until one during the rest of the month of July. The consortium is a coalition of 29 national medical societies that represents over 600,000 physicians, more than 60% of US doctors. There are also 47 partner organizations at the national and state levels representing millions of health professionals across the entire spectrum of healthcare and public health. There are also climate and health advocates uh, and you can sign up to be a climate and health advocate uh, on our news on our website at docsforclimate.org or just to receive the newsletter. I want to thank our technical WIS team for supporting this event today and say that in the next 10 years, there is a critical window of opportunity to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. To meet this challenge, major national medical societies in partnership with state medical societies, public health, nursing, and other allied health professional organizations and leading health groups have come together with the shared conviction that climate change is a health emergency that must be overcome. Our shared goal is to create a future where all people have clean air, clean water, and nutritious food, and where the climate has returned to a stable state. Today's webinar addresses air quality, climate change, and transportation. One CME credit is available from George Washington University for each webinar. The host for this series is Dr. Nilu Tumala. Dr. Tumala is an assistant professor of surgery at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She has a special interest in advocacy concerning the health effects of climate change and has been actively involved with research and medical education on this issue. She's on the steering committee of the Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action and was recently selected as a fellow for the Public Voices Fellowship on the Climate Crisis. Dr. Tamala. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Air Quality, Climate Change, and Transportation webinar. Some quick logistics before we start. We are going to do a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to drop your questions into the chat box. And also during the Q&A session, the link for the CME credits will be dropped into the chat box. So please answer those questions and you will have a link to the certificate. Please print out the CME certificate. We are told that this is the only way to have a record of the CME credit being offered. So I'm Neely Tamala, and I'm going to give a brief introduction of the public health impacts of poor air quality, specifically of particulate matter, before I introduce our speakers for the session. Next slide. 
patients are becoming the human face of the climate crisis. This quotation by Dr. Salas, an ER physician in Boston, could not be more true. As clinicians, whether we recognize it or not, we are often seeing the effects of the climate crisis in our patients. Whether it is patients enduring longer allergy symptoms due to lengthening of the freeze-free season, or young, healthy patients showing up with acute kidney failure during summer heat waves, or seeing increased rates of mental health concerns in the wake of intensified natural disasters. These patients are real life examples of the public health impacts of the climate crisis. And as clinicians, we bear witness to this. Next slide, please. Since the Clean Air Act was implemented in 1970, emissions of major pollutants were reduced by 73% between 1990 and 2015. The major pollutants are particulate matter, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxides, volatile organic compounds, and lead. The EPA determined that 230,000 deaths were avoided per year due to lower concentrations of outdoor particulate matter. In addition, other benefits include reductions in asthma exacerbations, 2.4 million fewer attacks per year, reductions in acute myocardial infarctions, 200,000 fewer cases per year, and avoiding 66,000 fewer admissions for respiratory conditions. The economic benefits valued at $2 trillion in 2020. The EPA determined that the monetized health benefits of the Clean Air Act exceeded the implementation costs by a factor of 32 to one. Next slide, please. Briefly, I'm going to go over traffic-related air pollution because this session is focusing on the transportation sector and air quality. Transportation is a major source of carbon emissions, but also of air pollutants. TRAP, also known as traffic-related air pollution, has several components, including nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. Moving forward, I'm going to focus on particulate matter but that is not to say that the other components are not incredibly important to monitor. Nitrogen dioxide, which is increasingly being recognized as an important indoor and outdoor pollutant generated by automobiles, has been shown to reduce lung function. One study showed that for every 10 parts per billion increase in classroom nitrogen dioxide concentrations, there was a 5% redu reduction in the FEV1 FVC ratio. Similarly, sulfur dioxide exposure has also been linked to reduced lung function and an increased rate of asthma-related emergency department visits. Next slide, please. Particulate matter is a well-known health concern and the size of the particulate matter is important, wherein smaller particles often pose a greater risk than larger ones. In the picture on the left, you can see the size of a standard human hair is about 50 to 70 microns, and comparatively, PM10 and PM2.5 are much smaller particles. The PM10 particles come from road and agricultural dust, tire wear emissions, construction, and demolition work. In addition, natural activities such as wildfires and wind-blown du wind dust are also the sources of PM10. Compared to PM10, the primary contributors of PM2.5 mainly come from traffic and industries, including the fuel combustion from power plants and oil refineries. PM2.5 indicates those fine particles less than 2.5 microns. Ultrafine particles include those particle diameters less than 0.1 microns, and the primary sources of ultrafine particles are tailpipe emissions from mobile sources. Based on numerous studies, the PM2.5 has been considered the main culprit of the adverse cardiovascular effects of air pollution on human health. Theoretically, PM10 particles preferentially deposit in the upper airways. Meanwhile, the PM2.5 and ultrafine particles are much more easier to reach the smallest airways and alveoli, and ultrafine particles may further penetrate the alveolar capillary membrane, which eventually spreads into the systemic circulation. Next slide, please. According to existing studies, particulate matter is associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, bronchial asthma, and several other respiratory diseases and increases the mortality of these diseases. It is also known that the risk and mortality rate of pneumonia increases in both children and adults with higher particulate matter exposure. 
Moreover, increased exposure in the high concentrations of atmospheric PM is associated with the development of lung cancer. This is really something important to talk about. There are two main mechanisms that PM 2.5 affects the respiratory tract, but a lot of this is actually still being studied. First, it triggers pulmonary oxidative stress. This oxidative damage is associated with the primary development of asthma and COPD. It also contributes to both acute and chronic inflammation. Acute exposure can cause airway hyperresponsiveness due to aggravation of the allergic inflammatory response and leads to acute asthma exacerbations. It also causes the expression of inflammatory cytokines and can produce reactive oxygen species, which are both associated with oxidative stress, but can also be directly generated from the surfaces of the particles. Long-term exposure to particulate matter has also been shown to result in airway remodeling. Next slide. The molecular mechanisms for particulate matter causing cardiovascular disease includes direct toxicity to the cardiovascular system or indirect injury by inducing systemic inflammation and oxidative stress in peripheral circulation. So let's first talk about the direct pathway. Due to the size, charge, and chemical composition of the ultrafine particles, it is much easier to cross the pulmonary epithelium and the lung blood barrier than the PM10 and other coarse particles. After deposition on the vascular endothelium, the ultrafine particles can aggravate the local oxidative stress and cause inflammation, resulting in atherosclerotic plaque instability and finally may lead to thrombus formation. The indirect pathway is associated with increased oxidative stress and activated inflammatory pathways in the pulmonary system, which I went over in the last slide. Considerable evidence has proved that particular air pollutants can trigger inflammation-related cascades where they deposit in the lungs. Systemic inflammation is a well-known risk factor for atherosclerosis progression, and those pro-inflammatory mediators are closely related to increased blood coagulability and endothelial dysfunction, which can exacerbate myocardial ischemia. Next slide. I'm going to talk about a few studies that really highlight the health effects of particulate matter. This study from the New England Journal of Medicine evaluated the associations of inhalable particulate matter with aerodynamic diameters of 10 microns or less and fine particulate matter with aerodynamic diameters of 2.5 microns or less with daily all-cause cardiovascular and respiratory mortality across multiple regions. It evaluated more than 600 cities across the globe, most of which were in the Northern Hemisphere. And it showed independent associations between the short-term exposure to PM10 and PM2.5 and daily all-cause cardiovascular and respiratory mortality. Next slide, please. I want to talk about certain vulnerable populations, and some of these we're talking about in greater detail in future sessions. Next week, we are focusing on communities of color, and the last session of this series, we will be talking about pregnancy, so I want to highlight children here. This is a prospective study of over 1,700 children from schools in 12 Southern California communities. Their lung function was measured annually for eight years. The communities represented a wide range of ambient exposures to ozone, acid vapor, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. Over the eight-year period, deficits in the growth of FEV1 were associated with exposure to nitrogen dioxide, acid vapor, and particulate matter with an elemental, with the aerodynamic diameter of less than 2.5 microns. The results of this study indicate that current levels of air pollution have chronic adverse effects on lung development in children from the age of 10 to 18 years. Next slide, please. Asthma is one of the most chronic illnesses of childhood, affecting over 6 million U.S. children. This review paper looked at 41 different studies. Results from this meta-analysis indicate a statistically significant association of exposure to black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, PM2.5, and PM10, and the risk of asthma development. Next slide. So the question is, does cleaner air mean better health? So this is a longitudinal study published in JAMA of over 4,100 children in Southern California who were followed from 1993 to 2014. The two graphics on the left show the relative decrease in nitrogen dioxide concentration on the top and PM2.5 on the bottom over this 10-year period. 
and you can see the relative slope downwards. Essentially, because of stricter regulations, there was cleaner air. air. The different colors just represent the different communities that were studied. Next slide, please. On the, uh, I think we might have gone one slide too many. I can go back one. Uh, let me check a little. Okay. Uh, there we go, perfect, sorry. Um, on the right, we now see two graphs showing the incidence of childhood asthma over this period. So to summarize the significant findings, on the top, a decline in nitrogen dioxide was significantly associated with lower childhood asthma incidence, and on the bottom, a decline in PM2.5 was also significantly associated with lower childhood asthma incidence. So yes, cleaner air leads to better health. In this case, fewer children with asthma. Next slide. So I'm going to finish up with a few words about COVID-19. This study is out of Harvard. It is undergoing peer review, but I'm sure many of you have already seen it. This nationwide cross-sectional study found an association between air pollution exposure over many years and death from COVID-19. For every one microgram per cubic meter increase in air pollution, there was an associated 8% increase in mortality from COVID-19 infections. So as the COVID-19 death rate keeps climbing and considering how much racial disparity the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted, again, which we'll talk about in more detail with the next session, we cannot ignore these important public health crises. Clean air is important for our health and is important for our patients. Next slide. Thank you all. Feel free to reach out to me via Twitter with any questions, concerns, or comments. And I'm incredibly excited now to introduce our first speaker, Scott Goldstein. So Scott Goldstein is the Policy Director for Transportation for America. Prior to joining Transportation for America, Scott worked as a, at the Congressional Relations Office for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Before the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Scott served as the Legislative Director for Congressman Harry Hank Johnson from Georgia, where he managed the legislative team and focused on transportation, health, foreign affairs, and energy policy. Scott also served in Congressman David Scott's office handling scheduling and constituent relations. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. So glad to be here. I come from a family of physicians, so um, I'm really glad to talk to this group. Um, I have a, quite a few slides, so I'm going to move quickly. Many of them are, are photos. Um, so uh, um, let's get started. Next slide, please. Um, it's just a run through of uh, my agenda. Just going to give a quick overview of federal transportation policy to kind of level set. Um, talk about how uh, my organization sees the real links between federal transportation policy, worsening climate change, health, and equity. Um, and then looking ahead um, at what's happening in the House and Senate um, and beyond. Next slide, please. So briefly um, about Transportation for America. Um, we are a nonprofit alliance of uh, elected business and civic leaders from communities across the country. We support moving people safely and affordably to jobs and services by multiple means of travel with minimal impact to communities and the environment. And we do this through advocacy, technical assistance, research, and analysis. And um, we're part of a broader uh, parent organization called Smart Growth America. Next slide, please. So just some level setting. Uh, folks may already know this, but um, there's two things happening right now at the federal level with transportation. There's appropriations and there's authorization or reauthorization you may hear. Appropriations, as I'm sure most know, is annual decisions Congress makes about how to spend the money that is authorized. Um, it's mostly the, the discretionary funding. The transportation authorization or reauthorization occurs usually about every five years and it sets policy for the next five years and governs what Congress might appropriate each year. Um, uh, and so we'll talk about the current law, the FAST Act, on the next slide. Here's a brief overview. Um, I think the key thing to see is the second bullet, 80% um, of the funding, uh, and this is traditional starting from the beginning of the highway program through today. 80% of current law is for roadways, 20% um, is for transit, and you can see the numbers there on the right in the pie chart. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of differences, not only in the overall funding amounts, but in how that funding can be spent. Um, every year, $40 billion is guaranteed through a formula to states for highways, and they can uh, do with that money virtually anything they want. Um, meanwhile, only $2.6 billion is available to build new public transit every year, and that funding is not guaranteed. It's part of the annual appropriations process. Um, 
when the funding goes out the door and states get, uh, get access to it, um, the federal government will cover um, 80%, sometimes 90% of the cost of a highway project, um, but they will only cover up to 50% of a transit project. So what this does is it places a huge burden on local communities that might uh, want to build transit uh, or, or some other type of infrastructure. It really makes the highway project cheaper by comparison. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, biking and pedestrian safety uh, receives roughly $850 million a year, which um, is a drop in the bucket. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about transportation and climate change, and I think um, the next panelist is going to address this, so I'll, I won't um, spend too much time, but um, transportation is now the single largest source of greenhouse gases. Um, other sectors, as you can see in that chart on the right, are, are staying relatively flat or even declining, but transportation is increasing. 83% um, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in transportation come from cars and trucks. And uh, so with other sectors increasing, we have a real problem on our hands uh, in this sector. Next slide, please. Um, transportation emissions are, are not as simple as sometimes the public conversation may suggest. Um, uh, emissions are the result of, of three things. It's fuel efficiency, it's how much carbon is in the fuel, uh, and how much we drive. Uh, and so we, we offer that it, you can think of it like a three-legged stool and that we have to address all three of those legs. We have to address the fuel, which is electrification. We have to address efficiency, which is cafe standards, um, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And we have to address vehicle miles traveled or VMT, how much we drive. Um, and if we don't, gains in two of these areas could be uh, negated by losses in the third. And um, that's exactly what's happening today as our emissions arrive, uh, emissions increase. Um, we have uh, gains in fuel, we're, we're electrifying our fleet. We have gains in efficiency. Our cafe standards have gone up for several years, notwithstanding the current debate we're having. Um, but we're driving so much uh, that it's overwhelmed those gains and that's where our emissions are going up. Next slide, please. And these are just a few pictures. We'll move through them quickly, but we're driving so much because of a built environment that looks like this. Next slide, please. We're driving so much because it's very unsafe to walk around in our communities. This is a slip lane um, in Atlanta. It's, we're driving so much because again, it's very unsafe, challenging to walk around. This is another photo from, uh, from around the country. Next slide. Uh, because here's a typical pedestrian experience. Um, in fact, this is not where I lived, but it looks just like where I used to live. Um, and I used to have to navigate, I'm a parent, um, a stroller around a pole in the middle of the sidewalk, just like that. Uh, and that's not uncommon, unfortunately, in our country. Um, and we're driving so much because um, our, our federal policy and by default, um, our state and local policy is all trying to deal with this, what you see on our screen, congestion. Um, and I'll talk about later on why, why that hasn't worked um, and what we can do to, um, uh, to actually address our issues. Next slide, please. Um, you already heard about the health benefits. Um, or health um, effects of, of transportation policy, but just to talk about it a little bit more, um, you know, we need active friendly transportation routes that uh, enable biking and walking and, and public transit and passenger rail. Um, and so the, the benefits are, are numerous, physical activity, traffic safety, and air quality. Next slide, please. This is just an example of some of the systemic disparities we see in um, active transportation. The blue is high income neighborhoods, the, the green is low income neighborhoods. And you can see that whether it's sidewalks, lighting, crosswalks, or, or traffic calming devices, um, they're much more prevalent um, in high income neighborhoods than low income neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Um, we've also done research on um, where it is safe and where it is not safe to be a pedestrian. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that research in a minute. But uh, people die while walking at much higher rates in lower income communities in this country. You can see that on this slide. Uh, and so if we want people to get out and do active transportation, we have to address that. Um, this is a, you're looking at our dangerous by design report. Um, we've identified where the most dangerous states are in the, in the, in the country um, for pedestrians. Next slide, please. Um, and I think uh, physicians will all know that um, as you sit in your car, your, your risk of obesity um, uh, goes up. And as you walk more, your risk of obesity goes down. Next slide, please. This is from the CDC. You can see a direct link between physical inactivity and diabetes. 
Uh, and what we're talking about with transportation is active transportation, creating a network where it's possible to, to drive less, to walk, take uh, bike and take transit more. And you can see uh, the implications of, of not being able to do that here. Next slide, please. Um, and there's impacts on communities of color. Um, uh, nationwide, uh, you can see the stats in front of you, but communities of color, whether it's African American, Asian American, Latinos, um, are more likely to live in areas that exceed air quality standards than, than white children. Uh, and Hispanics are, um, uh, suffer much higher rates of pedestrian fatalities, and African Americans suffer much higher rates of pedestrian fatalities than non Hispanic whites. Next slide, please. And then transportation choices are not just what we build, you can see a highway under construction. Next slide, please. But also where we build. This is the same highway, but now you can see that it's Overtown, uh, Miami, a historic African-American community. Uh, and this is one of many highways that tore apart the community, cutting it off from jobs and services. And with all of the traffic now traveling on that highways, um, creating um, health impacts from asthma and other things. Next slide, please. So from our organization's perspective, unless we reform federal policy, we're gonna continue with what we just saw. And unfortunately, a lot of what we talk about looks just like this. You have your current policy on the right, where it's a hostile environment to walk or be outside of a car in many places, uh, excuse me, on the left. And on the right, um, all of the vehicles are electric, which is certainly an improvement and we need to do that. But the, the built environment is no less hostile, uh, no more conducive to active transportation. Next slide, please. And here's another way to look at that. Um, we can electrify everything, again, something that we should do. Um, but uh, without reform, we'll have clean uh, or cleaner congestion. Next slide, please. So we have to talk about policy, not just funding. We have a policy problem. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to offer just a few things that my organization sees as the solution. Um, we have to prioritize maintenance. Um, right now, states are able to spend that um, guaranteed money for roadway expansion, letting the, the system they have fall apart. Uh, and as you'll see on the next slide, please. Um, that's what we've done. States have let the roads go into poor condition, um, despite getting uh, significant funding over the last uh, uh, five years and plus the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And we've built roads to cut across this country 83 times with that funding while letting our roadways uh, fall apart. Next slide, please. We have to design for safety over speed. Uh, we talked about the um, implications for um, um, active transportation if it's not safe. Uh, and so we have to uh, include designs and requirements for these designs to put safety first. Next slide, please. Um, this just shows you that over the last uh, several years, it's become more and more safe to be inside a vehicle and less and less safe to be outside of a vehicle, regardless of who you are. Of course, as we saw in a previous slide, it's even less safe if you are um, uh, uh, a person of color. Next slide, please. And this is just a photo that illustrates an example of why that's the case. This is a, unfortunately not a typical uh, environment. Those kids are waiting for a bus. Next slide, please. And last, um, our third principle is that we need to connect people to jobs and services, make that the goal of our system, as opposed to congestion reduction. And on the next slide, we'll start talking about why that's important. You can see here on the left that um, according to how we measure transportation success, that's an A plus. That's a roadway that cuts through a community. Rochester, I believe, um, and there's no traffic, it's free flow, um, and uh, that's an A+. Plus. On the right, um, there's traffic, there's stoplights, there's people, there's buses. That would be a failure because cars sitting there are delayed. Um, we would argue that the, the, the community on the right might, might be more economically vibrant, uh, at least in that photo, and um, we can talk a bit about more why, why we have to have a different measure of success. Next slide, please. Um, over the years, we have added capacity to deal with congestion, um, but we have failed to deal uh, with congestion, uh, despite adding capacity much faster than our population has, uh, has grown. And you can see there, 42% increase in freeway capacity, 32% increase in population in the top 100 metro areas, but 144% uh, increase in congestion. Next slide. Just a few cities from around the country uh, where you can see the impacts of that. But the, the point here is that in that call out box on the top left, we've expanded freeways that are uh, equivalent to population growth, faster than population growth, and slower than population growth, uh, excuse me, and expanded freeways with slow or no population growth. And yet in all cases, we've had more delay, more congestion. 
Next slide, please. Um, the reason for that, and this gets to how much we drive that I talked about earlier with climate change, uh, is that all this expansion is leading us to drive more. Um, since 1993, we're now driving on average 25 miles uh, per day. It was, nine, it was 21 miles per day in 1993. Next slide, please. Just a few examples from cities around the country. What is the um, cause of the delay? Uh, in, in virtually all cases, it's driving further. It's not actually an increase in delay. Next slide, please. So on Capitol Hill, you may have heard there's um, legislation moving. Um, the current law that I talked about earlier, the FAST Act is expiring. Um, and so the House has um, passed what's called the INVEST Act. And one of the many Senate committees with jurisdiction over this issue has passed um, ATIA, the uh, America's Transportation Investment Act. Um, from my organization's perspective, the House bill satisfied all of our, um, our um, requirements, on maintenance, on speed, and access, uh, and the Senate bill does not. Next slide, please. We also did a climate and transportation scorecard in partnership with Third Way. Um, there's a lot here. It may be tough to see on your screen, um, but the top line is that the House bill on climate um, meets many of our um, uh, metrics, whereas the, the Senate bill um, also does not meet the metrics on climate. Next slide, please. Um, I'm happy to talk more about those two bills and why they're important, but I just, I wanna be cognizant of the time. Um, so the state of play on Capitol Hill, the House has passed um, its five-year proposal, the INVEST Act. Um, only one Senate committee, the Environment and Public Works EPW committee has passed a bill. This is just a highways bill. Um, that was last July. It maintains the status quo primarily, and no other Senate committee has acted on transportation with nothing scheduled at this point. Um, between the House and Senate, there's no real plan to fund a long-term bill, which is certainly an obstacle. Um, and Congress, we would argue, is running out of time. Uh, and so we think reauthorization is unlikely to pass this year, um, and some extension of current law is most likely. And this is the result of differences between the House and Senate proposal um, and other pressing issues that we can all uh, you know, be aware of, like um, you know, another relief bill, for example, not to mention the election that's uh, fast approaching. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, and I believe this is the last slide. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, the House bill and the Senate bill, um, whether reauthorization happens this year, they're a marker for what happens in the next Congress. Um, and so the advocacy and engagement that you all are, are doing um, is critically important because um, we need um, policymakers to be thinking about these issues now. So when we get to the next Congress, um, we have a starting point where we can work from. And so my organization is very excited about uh, the INVEST Act as the starting point for uh, the conversation next year. Uh, and we think comparing it to the Senate bill will, will hopefully inspire folks to, to look at the INVEST Act as a nice marker. There's improvements that need to be made, certainly. Um, but uh, the, the key here is that the advocacy and engagement we do now will influence uh, what happens in 2021 and beyond. Uh, and that we hope, uh, and hopefully that this presentation has showed, that we need to shift the conversation away from funding, um, but onto policy. So I believe that's the end. Next slide, please. Yes, that was the last one. So thank you, everybody. I'm looking forward to the next presentation. Thank you, Scott. A lot of very valuable information there. It's kind of funny that slide that you showed of the kids by the bus stop. The only thing I was like, where are the masks? Where are the masks? Yeah, I know, right? Um, so real quick, I, I noticed that one of the questions was how to obtain CME credit. So again, during the Q&A session, we will drop the link into the chat box. And what you do is you go to the link, there's a couple of evaluation questions that have to be answered. And then that will then link you to a certificate. You can print out that certificate for one CME credit for today's webinar. Um, so next, I'm really excited to introduce Paulina Moratori, who is a senior campaign organizer for the Clean Transportation Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. In her role, she manages US, UCS's transportation campaigns in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic States with a focus on mobilizing UCS members, activists, and other experts to reduce tailpipe emissions while building a cleaner, more equitable transportation system. She also works with state and regional transportation coalitions, partnering closely with a wide range of groups to enhance our collective advocacy voice. Prior to joining UCS, Paulina worked with companies and investors on low carbon transportation alternatives with Ceres, and also worked as part of a New York Northeast regional advocacy team at the NRDC. Thanks, Paulina.
Thank you so much, Nilu, and thanks um, for having me uh, on this webinar today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I, like Nilu just said, my name is Paulina Muratori, and I'm a senior campaign organizer with the Union of Concerned Scientists, or UCS for short. Uh, I work in our clean transportation program, uh, and I manage mostly just the campaigns we work on in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Uh, a big part of my job involves finding ways to advocate and push for our clean transportation goals using a combination of robust analysis and science and using that to work with partners, coalitions, as well as engaging the public and mobilizing our thousands of supporters and science network members to take action with us. Um, so before I dive in, I just want to give you a little background on UCS to help set the context for the rest of my presentation today. I think you can go to the next slide. UCS is a national organization with 50 years of experience advocating for a healthier planet and a safer world. Next slide. We were founded in 1969 by scientists and students at MIT who were appalled at how the US government was misusing science. That year, the Vietnam War was at its height, and many of you may have seen these iconic images of um, Cleveland's heavily polluted Cuyahoga River that caught on fire because of how much pollution was in it. Um, UCS founders drafted a statement calling for scientific research to be directed away from military technologies and instead towards solving pressing environmental and social problems. And by mobilizing scientists and combining those voices with advocates, educators, businesses, and other concerned residents, the organization built a reputation for scientific accuracy and coalition building, as well as mobilizing the public to um, accomplish many of the things that we've done over the years. We've remained true to this theory of change for the course of the past 50 years. We've grown a bit, we're still learning a lot, um, but we've expanded to cover a wide range of issue areas from transportation, energy, food and environment issues, um, as well as issues impacting our democracy. So what started as a few scientists who wanted to become activists has grown into a national organization uh, with over 200 staff and a network of over 26,000 scientists across the country. Toward the end of my presentation, I'll come back to this idea of the science network and how you all can um, take action with us um, because uh, this is one key way that we mobilize folks through our campaigns to help build new cohorts of science advocates like all of you. Today, I'm gonna to talk mostly about transportation related air pollution and a lot of this has already been covered so I won't spend too much time so that we have plenty of time for questions. Um, but I wanna say first that when I say transportation, I mean just all on road or ground transportation. So I'm not including aviation or boats. Um, and I also wanna note that there are many sources of air pollution, not just from transportation. So why focus on transportation? Next slide. As you heard loud and clear from Scott just before me, transportation emissions are on the rise. And as you can see in this graph, yes, this is the right graph. It looks a little funky on here. Um, as you can see in this graph, uh, we've made progress in, in reducing emissions from other sectors such as the electric sector, while transportation has remained steady and even continues to grow. Um, and I noticed a question came in about the electric sector. It, yes, partially the reason that has gone down is because of a switch away from coal and more towards some natural gas, but also because of the sheer number of renewables that have come online in the past decade. But the implications for transportation emissions not going down um, causes major issues for both quality of life of people and the planet. And if our states are to meet any of our climate goals, they must work swiftly to transform the current transportation status quo. Next slide. Transportation is also a major source of ground level soot in the ozone, which we've heard a little bit about already. And what you see coming out of this tailpipe not only leads to those carbon emissions, but also contains dangerous particles that hang locally in the air and enter our respiratory systems. The nation's cars, trucks, and buses are responsible for thousands of asthma attacks, premature deaths, other pollution-related illnesses that incur billions in total healthcare costs every year. Uh, last year, UCS embarked on a 
study to look at transportation, air pollution, hotspots, in other words, where, how much, and which communities were bearing the brunt of our transportation pollution. Next slide. It should not come as a surprise that air pollution burdens are not equally shared. Communities of color across the country breathe a disproportionate amount of this pollution, nearly a third more on average when you look at total population, but this can be broken down even further on a much more granular level. In order to quantify these burdens, we looked at census track level data overlaid with race and other demographic information which allowed us to quantify and compare relative exposures to PM 2.5 from transportation. Next slide. On our website, we have an interactive map that you can look at and actually um, zoom in and look at data for every census tract in the country. The darker red spots are high exposure areas and I encourage you to check out this map when you have time. I'll make sure to send the direct link out um, or put it in the chat at the end. Um, so let's zoom in a little bit and look more closely at one region of the country. Next slide. On this slide, you will see a map of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states, which is the region that I focus on. It shows annual average concentrations of PM 2.5 pollution from on-road transportation. The darker red colors are the heavier concentrations. And in this collection of states, we found that communities of color breathe on average 66% more air pollution from vehicles than do white residents. And these numbers can be broken down even further. Latino residents of the region breathe on average 75% more PM 2.5 from transportation. Uh, for Asian American residents, that's 73% more. And for African American residents, 61% more. So as I mentioned, these numbers are striking, but sadly not surprising. Environmental injustice and systemic racism have led to a system that places pollution burdens on communities of color. Decades of decisions about where to build roads, like Scott mentioned, highways, housing decisions, where to invest in public transportation, have all contributed to the picture we see today. In many cases, local, state, and federal transportation policies have left communities of color with inadequate access to public transportation, divided by highways, breathing air polluted by congested roads, and without a seat at the table. COVID-19 has, as we all know, shown with abundant clarity that those who have been most impacted by the pandemic are almost the exact same communities that have historically borne the brunt of disproportionate air pollution. And that preliminary study that Nilu mentioned out of Harvard a couple months ago shows that even a very, very small increase in long-term exposure to PM 2.5 leads to an 8% increase in the mortality rate from COVID-19. These are very significant numbers. Um, this is unacceptable and we need to do better. Next slide. I think these days it can feel a little like we're going backwards at the national level, um, but as Scott highlighted, there is still a lot of potential and momentum and we need to keep that going and push even harder. Um, but some more good news is that there's a lot we can do locally at the state and regional levels to fight for more sustainable, equitable transportation future as we emerge also from the pandemic. Just two weeks ago, we witnessed a historic moment when the California Air Resources Board passed the first electric truck sales standard. This standard requires manufacturers to sell a certain number of electric heavy duty trucks each year, beginning in 2024. As you might imagine, heavy duty trucks don't represent the largest share of vehicles that are on our roads, but they contribute disproportionately to health outcomes due to the complex local pollutants that emerge when combusting diesel fuel. This landmark decision in California is a high bar for the rest of the country to follow, but we can and will ramp up advocacy and pressure in other states to follow suit and get those dirty health damaging trucks off the road. Next slide. Another emerging policy I want to mention in front of us today is called the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Um, this is an initiative of all of the states you see here in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic working together to create a regional program that would set a limit on transportation emissions generate revenue and invest back into clean modern alternatives. Together, this group of states that you see here have a total population of over 72 million people 
and a GDP that is larger than any country other than the US and China. And as we all know, pollution does not respect borders. So the more states involved, the better, which is why ideally we can, can and should move forward at the national level, but going beyond just one state at a time, it's helpful to have such a large group of states involved. There's still a lot to be determined about this program. Um, and in the shifting landscape around us, state officials who are designing it need to pay extra attention to making sure guardrails are set to ensure the program dedicates revenue to only clean transportation alternatives, for example, not to expanding highways, as well as making sure that investments benefit those who have been impacted the most by, clean uh, by pollution from transportation. Next slide. A better system truly is within reach. We have the tools, we have technology, we have um, momentum from advocates and residents alike. We need to keep pushing our elected officials, decision makers to um, make the right choices that lead to a healthier, cleaner future. Um, we need holistic solutions that include everything from electric buses, enhanced bike and pedestrian infrastructure, electric cars, expanded modern public transportation, and better land use policy. There is no one size fits all solution here. We need to be thorough and we need an it takes everyone kind of approach to tackle this very complex sector and really change behavior. Next slide. I'm gonna move relatively fast through these ones um, because we are coming up on the Q&A uh, period, but I wanna just say a few words about how you can get involved. Um, we really need you, we need everyone in this fight to, to kind of tackle what we're seeing in front of us today. Um, there can seem to be an overwhelming number of causes to get involved with, but I think this community of medical professionals is uniquely positioned to help be voices for change. One key way to get involved that I'll offer to you today is our science network. Like other organizations, UCS is a member-based nonprofit, but in addition to our activist network, we have a specific science network. Next slide. The science network is um, composed of over 26,000 scientists, engineers, medical professionals, and other technical experts united by a desire to use their specialized skills and knowledge for public good. Members work with us to build power on critical issues and campaigns, which again are everything from um, transportation, food, energy, reducing the threat of nuclear weapons to um, issues in our democracy. And beyond UCS issues alone, the Science Network helps its members realize and apply their own power to almost any issue with the goal of improving lives and outcomes for all. We provide advocacy trainings, we help uh, Science Network members write op-eds and LTEs, we do specific scientists and medical expert sign-on letters. Um, and while decision makers are used to receiving kind of cookie cutter petitions and, and expert, uh, or sorry, just regular kind of activist letters, we think that there's added value in having specific um, experts, health professionals and others help add weight uh, and influence the policy position. So your expertise can lend both credibility and authority, and we'll help you figure out how to be a science advocate. The last thing I wanna mention is a new, uh, next slide, uh, an emerging opportunity, a little hard to see, but what this is, is um, a platform we've been working on called the Science and Community Action Network, um, which is a community-centered platform aiming to bring together grassroots movements, specifically around freight pollution um, and scientists and other experts from across the country. This emerged from um, a group that UCS is part of called the Moving Forward Network, which is a group of grassroots um, organizations and environmental justice groups who fight specifically freight pollution. And for example, in this photo from ports um, or other warehouse um, adjacent communities. Um, and there was a desire to be able to connect in a platform with experts who could help advance the fights that these local communities are aiming to, to um, that are, are engaged in. Um, so I'm happy to send more info to anyone who's interested in learning more about SciCan. It has not publicly launched yet, but hopefully in the fall it will be. Next slide. Um, these will be posted, so don't worry if you don't have time to do this, but you can text SCIENCE to 662266 if you are interested in joining the Science Network. And on the next slide, there's a few more ways to get involved. And again, don't worry if you can't write this down fast enough. Um, 
And on the last slide um, is my email address if you want to specifically get in touch with me. I'm a campaign organizer, so I work directly with our scientists and our um, and members of the public, as well as coalitions, and, and love to talk with anyone who, who wants to get involved. So thank you so much, and looking forward to all the questions you might have now. So real quick, I'll just answer one of them. Sorry, before Mona, before you jump in. Sorry. Um, there was a question, no, that's totally fine. There was a question about the Clean Air Act and the number of lives saved per year. So basically um, what the EPA has estimated is that in 2020, there'll be 230,000 lives saved per year. Um, but that, ha that number has increased slowly over the years since the Clean Air Act and its amendments were um, instituted. And so back in like 2010, the estimates is like 160,000 and slowly that number has increased and it is per year. Okay, so uh, I have a question here. Um, this is for everybody, I guess. With the population moving to suburbs due to concerns about uh, social distancing um, and due to concerns about social distancing, is it realistic to expect that sprawl-induced emissions from transportation can be reduced? Um, I'll just jump in. Um, I, I think the answer is, is yes. Um, uh, you know, to reduce emissions from transportation, we would argue that you have to electrify, you have to improve vehicle efficiency, and you have to make it possible to drive less. And it might seem that you know, the suburbs, by definition, will not meet that last, um, that last point. But there are ways to make the suburbs more connected. Um, you know, I, I had quite a few slides and, and wasn't able to obviously include them all, but we have examples of slides where two homes back to back um, have a nine mile drive between them, even though they're in a suburb, uh, because that's just the design of the community. Um, there are lots of different ways in which we can improve designs and connectivity to allow for shorter trips, even in suburbs. We can create walkable town centers in our suburbs. So instead of a, a typical, perhaps suburban strip mall, we can have more town center type developments where you maybe you drive there, but once you're there, you can do your uh, whatever business you may have um, on foot. Um, so, you know, those are just a few examples. There's, there's no one size fits all solution, but it is possible to, to make our suburbs uh, more inviting for, for um, driving less, um, and taking fewer and shorter car trips. And I should also mention because um, uh, folks may be interested, part of that is also passenger rail uh, and, and connections to transit that might run through our suburbs. Um, and so anyway, I'll stop there, but, but the short answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Um... Here's another question uh, about the uh, environmental justice aspects of the transportation proposals in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Is it possible to, uh, to provide more detail on that? Is the question, uh, I guess I can, tr I can try. I'm not sure if I totally understand exactly the question, but, um, I think it is, is definitely fair to say that the process of how this policy is developed really matters and that it has not adequately centered the voices of environmental justice communities. So that is something, I, I'm not from an EJ group, so I would encourage talking directly with those constituencies, but many of our partners, I'm based in Massachusetts, here in Massachusetts, we're in regular conversations about, about this, um, similar conversations happening around the region. Um, and so just like in a lot of other processes in history, um, the right voices have not always been at the table. And I think that if the states continue moving forward with this, they really need to make sure that that happens. Um, and if it doesn't, I think that there, there could be um, issues with support moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, Assuming uh, that the nation approves an infrastructure bill, what measures uh, do you forecast that will be built that will be climate friendly and specifically uh, new construction, technologies, electric car plugins, et cetera? Um, I'll, I guess I'll just jump in here. Um, certainly my organization would hope that any legislation has all those new technologies you just mentioned. Um, we, we very much need to electrify and make it convenient for people to, to charge and, 
and use those electric vehicles. Um, we very much need to have, you know, more climate and environmentally friendly um, construction um, materials and processes and, you know, permeable pavement and all of that. Um, but the thing that my organization is specifically interested in is how can we use our programs to incentive, incentivize, um, you know, different land use um, uh, uses around the country. Uh, as you saw, you know, for years, our, our program has been 80% highways and 20% transit. What can we do to change that dynamic? What can we do to change um, the transit that we're building and the highways that we're building? On the highway side, how can we make them uh, about connectivity and about safe streets for all users, uh, cyclists, transit riders, um, pedestrians? Um, how can we make sure that those safe streets are um, in all communities, low income, communities of color, et cetera? Um, on the transit side, um, how can we make sure that um, we have, you know, better and more reliable service. Uh, you know, having a bus that comes once an hour um, and, and we don't know when it's going to come in that hour isn't um, necessarily helpful for people. So how can we have better service, more reliable service? So there's a lot of things that federal policy that we would look towards in federal policy to really um, address some of those things. And, you know, without going into all the detail, we, we do think that the INVEST Act takes us a, a big step forward um, in addressing some of those. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask how you um, feel that listeners uh, to this webinar and their uh, colleagues can weigh in effectively on some of these policy choices. What are the right ways to weigh in and how can people make a difference? Oh, sure. Um, I, that is a great question, Mona. Thank you. Um, you know, we have, uh, if you go to our website, t4america.org, we have a number of ways in which you can um, fill out a form and send an email to your congressman or senator. Um, on these issues. But uh, the most important thing, even if you don't use our form, is to reach out, uh, contact your congressperson, contact your senator, and tell them, you know, the status quo for the last 70 years in transportation has, has worsened health, has worth, worsened equity, um, and we need to do something different. Most members of Congress uh, don't run on and get elected uh, for transportation issues. They have so many other issues that, um, you know, power their campaigns. And Transportation comes around every five years, and then the policy is locked in for the next five years. And so we're in a period where Congress is looking at transportation, and if they don't hear from folks like the people on this call and others around the country that they want something different, um, then we may end up with the status quo again, and it'll be five more years before we can change things. So let your Congress member know, uh, let your, your Senator know, um, and uh, you know, certainly let us know how we can help you with talking points or anything else. Uh, you know, go to our website, but if there's something that you want more detail on, we are more than happy to provide it. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to point out to everybody that the link uh, to obtain CME credit is now in the chat. And I'd like to thank uh, all of the, the presenters um, and the technical team for participating in this webinar today. And uh, remind everybody that we have another one next Friday, same time, same station. So thanks. <laughs>